Thank you very much, friend. Good evening, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are not too tired. I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight, and I want to thank the Atlantic Council and Globsec for bringing us together. And I also want to say that the fact that my three Visegrad colleagues were sitting on the panel and I'm standing in front of you delivering a speech does not mean that I consider myself more important. <laughs> the, the, the reason is more prosaic. I came directly from the train station. I came from New York when I had pr uh, commitments earlier uh, this today at the United Nations. So sometimes it's an advantage to come late. But thank you for giving me this opportunity and the honor to address you. And I want to say that it is incredibly important to bring Central Europe to Washington and to speak about the transatlantic bond. And it is more than symbolic to do so now, in 2019. Slovakia will commemorate the Velvet Revolution of 1989 just in a few months, marking exactly 30 years since our region found freedom and renewed lasting friendship with the United States. But let me recall the very first such anniversary, November 17, 1990. On that day, President George Bush Sr. and First Lady Barbara came to Czechoslovakia to celebrate freedom with Czechs and Slovaks. In his speech to cheering crowds, President Bush recalled that when the US Declaration of Independence was first read in public in 1776, a bell tolled to proclaim the thrill of that moment. President then donated a copy of the Liberty Bell to the people of Czechoslovakia and rang it three times. Once for the courage, once for the freedom, and once for the children. A truly great moment in the history of the friendship between the United States and Central Europe. In those early 90s, President Bush used to speak a lot about a new world order. Order based on rules and cooperation among the freedom-loving nations. He spoke of the world where, in his words, the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle. The transatlantic relationship was and remains central in shaping such an international order. It is, however, becoming more and more clear that these aspirations would not fully materialize. The rules we have created have been bent. One of the panels here this afternoon addressed the potential for transatlantic cooperation in the era of great power competition, which is a very accurate title, as this is exactly where we seem to be headed. From the golden age of multilateral institutions, international law, and the values of transatlantic bond transcending the power relations, we are once again moving to the era of multipolarity. All while relationships between the most important powers are filled with mistrust, many medium-sized powers are asking for a bigger say in global politics, and all this is taking place in an era of unprecedented technology and information proce progress. Keeping the old status quo is not an option anymore. This is a new game with new rules. So where is the transatlantic relationship in all of this? I think then in this competition, the strength of the transatlantic bond will determine whether the Western civilization will be the major player or a playing field. We need to do our best to renew this bond, because I do not think we want to imagine the order where the words of President Bush would play in reverse, namely where the rule of the jungle would supplant the rule of law. So I would say tonight, Let's revisit the idea of President Bush from November 17, 1990, and once again ring the bell three times. And this time, I would propose once for our unity, because it takes courage to go together, once for our values, because they are the bedrock of freedom, and once for our world, because it already belongs to our children. So first for our unity. In this new setting, both sides of Atlantic are looking to better their stance on the chessboard. There is a lot of talk in Europe on the strategic autonomy, and there is a lot of talk in the United States on foreign policy of national interest. With significant changes in US foreign policy doctrine, the administration is working to ensure that the future of international agreements unambiguously advances American interests, in words of Secretary Pompeo. But here, I would argue that it is a vital American interest to see European Union succeed. 
and vice versa. Our own national interests are better served when we keep the transatlantic bond strong. Generations of American leaders understood that the US benefited from having a strong partner in the European Union. That's why the United States has always been the greatest ally and supporter of the European integration. Because it made sense. And it still does. Together we formed the Western civilization holding dear principles of democracy, rule of law and human rights. Together we formed the largest and most integrated economic, trade and investment relationship in the world. And together we share the same global interests in world affairs. And I'm saying this without downplaying the depth of our current disagreements. We believe that some actions taken with regard to the Middle East peace process or JCPOA do not serve our collective interests. We believe that trade does not need to be a zero-sum game and we can all enjoy economic growth by inventing and creating value. And we are worried to see this great, great country step back from international institutions and view multilateral structures as an obstacle to American interests rather than a tool to advance interests of us all, including America. But despite these differences, we are still pursuing so much together. We share the interest to see peace and reconciliation in the Balkans, in Syria, Korean Peninsula, and the list goes on. We want to see the crisis in and around Ukraine resolved. We want to see this world free of terrorism. And of course, we continue to work together in NATO, going strong and welcoming new members in. US has increased its presence in Europe over the last years. North America with Europe are doing more together, with more partners, in more places than ever before. And that, of course, includes increase in our defense spending. So as opposed to those days during 1990s, Europe today is bigger, stronger, and much more reliable partner considerably thanks to the help from the United States. And we should be even more, take even greater responsibility for our own security and defense. I understand that the talk of strategic autonomy irritates some, but for me, this means seeing the European Union stand its ground in the new power competition. European Union ready to stand up alongside the United States and under the umbrella of NATO, and I'll repeat this, alongside the United States and under the umbrella of NATO, to defend and project our values. For me, it means being the mature stakeholder we have the potential to be. Because if we do not stand as a player in this game, the only other alternative is to be reduced to a plaything. So going forward, I would use the same argument. In this complicated multipolar competition, even the biggest powers will need friends. Strong friends. Strong Europe is the best way to advance America's own interests. There is no friendship more natural, because we are not just a community of interests, but also a community of values. So the second bell toll goes for our values. On that autumn day, in Prague 1990, President Bush said that Czechoslovakia, as the lonely victim of appeasement a century ago, would now be the first to understand that, and I quote, there is right and there is wrong, there is good and there is evil, and there are sacrifices worth making. Standing up for the good, sacrificing for the right turns in history, that made America the extraordinary place it is. And right now, we seem to be at one of history's critical junctures. As we are headed to the multipolar world, it becomes all the more clear that these values are owned to us, but are not shared by all. Now we cannot step back from them or compromise on them. As the United States are finding new pride in America's interests, I would argue that our interests and our values can only go hand in hand. We have an interest in promoting our values. One of our strongest tools to inspire societies 
has always been the example of our values, our ability to lead by example. They are the bedrock we need to protect, and we are especially reminded of that on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. We are again reminded that democracy is never finished and we need to cultivate it constantly by supporting civil society, protecting minorities, and doing responsible politics so that our people do not feel compelled by voices of populists and extremists. That's how we can keep our transatlantic family strong. And while a strong fam family is fundamental for any of its members to feel secure at home, it is smart to keep friendly relations with neighbors. That's why our predecessors created the multilateral institutions. Because the world is bigger than the Atlantic. So the third bell toll goes for our world. I know the institutions are not working perfectly and trust me, having been the president of the UN General Assembly and currently the chair of the OSC, I know exactly what I'm talking about. But that's the feature of their design. They absorb heavy pressures stemming from different, often opposing interests. But I believe it's better to have these pressure, pressures absorbed within those organizations than erupting outside. And so, as in Europe we see renewed, renewed focus on national states versus integration, and in the US we see the tendency to focus on national interests versus multilateralism, Let's be fair and acknowledge the vast amount of good work these organizations are producing on a daily basis. It's enough to think about the OSC monitors in Ukraine or the UN peacekeepers in distant, distant corners of this planet. These institutions are the legacy of generations of Americans and Europeans, working side by side to establish a multilateral order. President Woodrow Wilson championed the first universal international organization. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was there at the establishment of the United Nations. The world's modern economic system was born in Bretton Woods, and the North Atlantic Treaty was signed in this very city. And I truly believe that multilateralism continues to be the best tool to advance global peace and security, which, and you will agree with me, are in the American interests as well. So, dear colleagues, friends, on the 30th anniversary of democracy in Central Europe, we must remember that the friendship between Europe and the United States needs a constant investment, not just in political or economic terms, but also through research, dialogue, and people-to-people -people contacts. And that starts at a place, places like this. The work of the Atlantic Council and Globsec is extremely vital for nurturing, cultivating, sometimes maybe even healing the transatlantic bond. And I'm very grateful for creating this space, space and possibility to meet. Before I conclude, I have one last pleasant opportunity, which is to invite you all to the reception co-hosted by the Slovak Embassy. Please enjoy the reception and the rest of the evening. Thank you very much.